the Fitch Foundation is pleased to be hosting Nadia Nenadich, a 2016 mid-career fellow to present Remembering and Forgetting Historic Preservation in San Juan, Santo Domingo, and Havana. Nadia is one of over 60 fellows which the Fitch Foundation has supported in the 32 years since being established in 1989. We're extremely proud to have supported an incredible range of projects ranging uh, out within the allied fields of historic preservation from architectural history and materials conservation to community development and engagement, land use policy, landscape architecture, intangible historic resources, and much, much more. Looking to our future, the James Marston Fitch Charitable Foundation is committed to actively contributing to the urgent call to diversify the field of historic preservation. For the Fitch Foundation, this goes beyond our selection of mid-career mid fellows to cultivating the next generation of professionals and facilitating the discovery of preservation as a career path for BIPOC students. So towards this goal, we're very glad to be partnering with our colleagues at the National Trust for Historic Preservation's African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund to support and provide mentoring for promising young people at the very start of their preservation careers. So please stay tuned for more updates. We're very excited to be sharing more about that as the first class of students um, moves into action. Uh, but for now, let's go ahead and turn to the focus of our evening here tonight. With her eye trained on the trio of Havana, Santo Domingo, and San Juan, Nadia Nenadich's study seeks to understand the different paths that each of these three cities has taken and how, they are, how those paths are reflected in both the social construction of space and of memory and the impact this has had on historic preservation in these cities. As Nadia has noted, what we choose to remember impacts what we preserve and how we pr preserve it. Tonight, she will walk us through her look at what, how, and why these cities have each decided to preserve what they have and the influence that these decisions have had in the cities and in the uh, larger cultural memory of the populace. So with that said, Nadia, I'm gonna stop share and turn the mic over to you. Good afternoon. I'd like to begin by thanking the James Marston Fitch Foundation for the incredible opportunity that they have given me with this grant. Support for research and historic preservation is not easy to come by, which makes the work that they do so important. My work in historic preservation has focused on exploring the connections between memory and space. This project addresses the complexities inherent to the preservation of cities with a colonial past and or present, and tries to understand the role that memory has played in shaping preservation narratives, as well as our cities. Today, I will present a summary of this research project entitled Remembering and Forgetting Historic Preservation in San Juan, Santo Domingo, and Havana. I will briefly talk about the historical development of these three cities and about how preservation initiatives began. I'll also talk about memory and the role it plays in historic preservation and highlight some of the similarities and differences about the preservation attitude in these cities. We will then focus on San Juan as a case study to better understand the relationship between remembering and forgetting in historic preservation. What we remember, how we remember, and what we forget are key questions that need to be considered when we talk about historic preservation. The answers to these questions are as important as the built fabric we see as a result of preservation efforts. Exploring these questions helps us recognize the selections we make and the narratives we built around heritage. These processes of selection is something that is particularly interesting and that takes on a special meaning in places like San Juan, Santo Domingo, and Havana. What we remember and what we forget is a great place to begin to talk about preservation in the Hispanic Caribbean. While doing my PhD, I came across the writings of Paul Ricoeur, a 20th century French philosopher. His work first takes up the question of memory and recollection in response to questions about uses and abuses of memory in contemporary society. Ricoeur also seeks to address the problem of forgetting 
arguing that traces of the past can be lost and that it can be forgotten in the sense of being beyond memory. But he explains the issue of forgetting where traces remain. This reminds me of the incomplete history of Puerto Rico I was taught. And it especially made me question the narrative, narratives we have built around our colonial heritage and how it has affected what we have chosen to preserve in Puerto Rico. It made me want to compare how other cities with similar colonial past had approached these issues. I was particularly interested in Santo Domingo and Havana because they present a unique opportunity to compare three cities that are as similar as they are different. If you have visited all three of these cities, there may be moments when it's easy to confuse them. There is so much they share. Some of their similarities date back to pre-colonial times when the indigenous people that inhabited the Antilles migrated from South America to the Caribbean. Although there were different periods of migration, these groups settled through most of the Antilles, creating similar cultures through the islands. The similarities that these countries shared continued with the arrival of the Spaniards as they began to create strongholds of the Spanish empire in the so-called new world. From the 16th to the 19th century, the walled cities of San Juan, Santo Domingo, and Havana followed somewhat comparable paths as enclaves of the Spanish empire. As the first colonized territories in the new world, these cities saw the development of parallel societies that established themselves both in conjunction with, as well as aside from Spain. Because of their geographical location, these three cities served as frontier lands in the Caribbean. Their strategic location positioned them as vital strongholds for the protection and the expansion of the Spanish empire. They also became important ports of trade that fostered commerce and exchange. From the start, these cities operated under the coexistence of multiple systems. On the one hand, there was a political and legal system of imperialistic nature set forth by Spain. On the other, there was a Northern European commercial system that promoted these port cities to look outward. When we talk about the Hispanic Caribbean and particularly the insular Caribbean, we can point to the numerous characteristics they share in their historical evolution that were a direct result of the colonization process. For example, their role as laboratories for the political experiment of expansion and the inevitable social experiment that resulted from it. However similar, each of these cities was established by Spain with a different purpose that I wanna review before delving more in depth into a broader history. In the early 16th century, Santo Domingo was the only European city in America. As others were established, it became the most important city in the Caribbean. As its density grew, so did its role as a point of arrival into the Americas, and eventually the place of departure to other Caribbean expeditions. It quickly became the political epicenter of the new world. The city of Santo Domingo grew slowly through a series of urban areas that were generated by and responded to diverse socioeconomic groups. The heart of the colonial city, known as the city of Obando, was a seat of power and its urban form reflected the social hierarchies of its people. By 1496, the Spaniards had set up the first colony in the Western Hemisphere in Santo Domingo, which would later become the capital of all Spanish colonies in America. In 1697, the Treaty of Ryswick gave the Western part of the Española Island to France and the eastern part to Spain, dividing the island between Haiti and Santo Domingo, today the Dominican Republic. A hundred years later, Spain gave up its portion to France only to take back control a decade later. After a brief period of independence from Spain in 1822, Haitian President Boyer annexed Santo Domingo to Haiti until 1844 when Santo Domingo declared its independence and became the Dominican Republic. There was a quick return to Spanish rule and in 1865, the second Dominican Republic was proclaimed. In 1906, the Dominican Republic and the US signed a 50 year treaty in which the US took over the country's custom department in return for buying its debt. And 10 years later, US forces occupied the Dominican Republic until a constitutional government assumed control in 1924. Six years later, Rafael Trujillo established a dictatorship that would last until his assassination in 1961. 
In 1962, Juan Bosch, founder of the Dominican Revolutionary Party, was elected president in the first democratic election in four decades. A year later, he was deposed in a military coup and replaced by a civilian junta. In 1965, the U.S. invaded the Dominican Republic again, following a pro-Bosch uprising, and in 1966, Joaquin Balaguer, a Trujillo protege and former leader of the reformist party was elected president. What distinguished San Juan was its strategic location and it came to be known as the key to the Antilles. It first served as the boundary between the remaining indigenous strongholds in the Lesser Antilles and Spain's stronghold in the Caribbean. Once the Lesser Antilles were converted into agricultural colonies by other European nations, San Juan continued to serve a vital geopolitical role. Because of its importance as a key to the Antilles, San Juan was invaded in multiple occasions, making it necessary to erect a system of complex fortresses and wall systems for its protection. San Juan's complicated geography and its systems of walls protected it from outside invasions, but it also distanced it from the rest of its hinterland. Only one door within the wall system, the door of Santiago, gave land access to the islet of San Juan. The area within the walls was home to the Spanish elite. In 1493, Columbus claimed Puerto Rico for Spain, which remained a Spanish colony until 1898 when it was ceded to the US at the end of the Spanish war under the Treaty of Paris. For the first two years after this, there was a military government before a civilian one was established in 1900. Almost two decades later, the US Supreme Court declared that Puerto Rico was a territory and not part of the union. And in 1917, Puerto Ricans were granted US citizenship. In 1947, a partial self-government was granted enabling Puerto Ricans to elect their own governor. Luis Muñoz Marín was the first elected governor. In 1950, President Truman signed the Puerto Rico Commonwealth Bill, paving the way for a Puerto Rican constitution, which was ratified two years later. In 1973, the United Nations Assembly voted 104 to 5 in favor of a resolution submitted by the Decolonization Committee, which recognized Puerto Rico as a colony of the U.S. Through the years, there have been several referendums, 1951, 67, 93, 98, 2012, on the country's status, with various results ranging from remaining a commonwealth to becoming a state, and with various levels of participation. Today, there are close to 10 million Puerto Ricans, with more than 6 million of them living in the U.S., in the continental U.S., those that do, like myself, are eligible to vote in the presidential election, and those that don't do not have that right. Havana's location near the current of the Gulf of Mexico, its easy to access bay, and the high quality of the produce of its hinterland position it as a definite port for ships coming into and out of the Americas. It would come to be known as the key to the new world. While San Juan and Santo Domingo remained distant from the rest of their own hinterland, Havana was connected to itself as well as to the rest of the Western Caribbean. By the end of the 16th century, it was growing at a rate that far surpassed its Caribbean counterparts. An element that helped this expansion was the construction of, a sa of the San Real, an aqueduct started in 1566 that brought water from the river into the city. The development of this piece of infrastructure positioned Havana at an advantage that was soon echoed in its urban form. Taking advantage of these conditions, merchants from different parts of Spain and Europe settled in Havana, and the city soon became a reflection of both diverse architectural styles and economic affluence. Once in Santo Domingo, the Spaniards embarked on missions to nearby islands. The Spanish conquest of Havana began in 1511. In 1762, Havana was briefly captured by the British, but returned to Spain a year later. From 1868 to 78, Havana waged a 10-year war of independence that ended in a truce with Spain with promises of reforms and greater autonomy. This were made to Santo Domingo and Puerto Rico as well. Around that time in Havana, from 1895 to 98, Jose Martí led a second war of independence against Spain. Four years later, Cuba became independent with Tomás Estrada as president. Mm -hmm. 
However, under the Platt Amendment, Cuba was kept under U.S. protection, with the U.S. reserving the right to intervene in Cuban affairs. This amendment was kept in place until 1934, a year after Fulgencio Batista gained control and established a U.S.-backed dictatorship that followed Machado's totalitarian regime. After an initial failed attempt in 1953, Fidel Castro led an army into Havana, forcing Batista to flee and becoming prime minister of Cuba in 1959. Two years later, Washington broke off diplomatic relations with Cuba, resulting in the Bay of Pigs, and Castro declared Cuba a communist state, allied with the USSR, who remained in Cuba until its collapse in 1991. Although San Juan, Santo Domingo, and Havana share many similarities, the roles they occupied as colonies of the Spanish Empire were vastly different. Equally different were the paths they followed after 1898 when Spain lost the Spanish-American War and was forced to relinquish its territories under the Treaty of Paris. The appearance of the U.S. in the political landscape of these countries would mark a break from Spanish colonial rule, although not necessarily a break from colonialism. The history of these countries in the 20th century is quite different, and these differences have influenced both the construction of space as well as the preservation narratives. In all three of these cities, preservation offices were created in the 20th century to begin and to oversee conservation efforts. In Santo Domingo, the Oficina de Patrimonio Cultural or Heritage Office was created in 1967 by the then president Joaquin Balaguer with the purpose of preserving the old city of Santo Domingo. Among its first projects was to define the boundaries of the colonial city with the idea of focusing all efforts on preservation projects that could revitalize that part of the city. For the next decade, at least the heritage office would work exclusively on the preservation of Spanish colonial buildings. The beginning of the preservation movement in Santo Domingo focused exclusively on colonial buildings. This promoted the idea that Dominican heritage was synonymous with Spanish colonial heritage. That idea was not only inbuilt in the collective imaginary, but it was also echoed in Law 318 of 1968, where the category of monumental heritage was reserved for colonial buildings. Later structures were categorized as other buildings of historical and artistic value. A year later, under Law 492, only one 19th century building was incorporated into the Monumental Heritage category, and that was the house in Monte Cristi where Cuba's independence was signed. We can see in this idea of the preeminence of colonial heritage in this video that explains the different types of heritage and categories and categorizes cultural heritage as movable, immovable, and intangible. I found several of them mostly geared toward children, but in all of them, the examples of immovable heritage are of colonial buildings. No pueden ser trasladados de un lugar a otro, como son la Fortaleza Osama, el Alcázar de Colón, la Catedral Primada de América y el Ingenio Boca de Nigua. Por último está el Patrimonio Material. Even though these laws initially only protected colonial buildings, they did begin to create a collect collective awareness on the importance of heritage. In 2006, the city approved the Holistic Revitalization Plan for the city of Santo Domingo, with the purpose of regulating zoning and use and establishing categories and methods of intervention in historic buildings. There are six categories in the plan Number one, which you see in magenta, is reserved for buildings that are considered national monuments. Two, going down the list, for buildings of historical and architectural significance. Category three is for buildings with environmental significance, which means buildings without historical or architectural significance that through time have maintained the harmony of the urban form. And this category is reserved for buildings that are from vernacular architecture only. Category four is for buildings that have historical significance or architectural significance, but have been partially altered. And the last category is for buildings without historical or architectural significance that through time have maintained the harmony of the urban form and have been built in the second half of the 20th century.
What you see in yellow represents new constructions that are considered compatible with the context, and in blue, those that are not compatible. Edwin Espinal, Commissioner of the Board of Directors of the Dominican Academy of History has praised the role that the Office of Conservation played since its creation in 1967, the vast amount of work it has done to preserve Dominican heritage and to foster public awareness. Nevertheless, in a 2017 interview, he recognized that a great majority of the resources have been allocated to preserve Spanish colonial heritage in Santo Domingo, and there, that there's still a lot of work ahead. As early as 1935, Havana had a city historian who worked within the mayor's office first and later within the Department of Culture. Three years later, an independent office of the historian was created. Emilio Roy held this position until his death in 1964. Four years later and until his death in 2020, Cuban historian Eusebio Leal would lead the city's conservation efforts, creating a holistic and autonomous model. It is impossible to talk about historic preservation in Cuba without talking about Eusebio Leal. The two are almost synonymous. In 1928, a few years before the creation of the Office of the Historian, the government had passed a law declaring some buildings national monuments. In the late 70s, law number one and number two were passed to grant protection to cultural resources. In 1977, law number one for the protection of natural cultural heritage was approved. It created the National Register of Cultural Properties managed by the Ministry of Culture. The purpose of the registry was to establish, organize, and supervise a general inventory of cultural properties. The following year, a National Monuments Commission was formed under the regulation of law number two of national and local monuments. In 1979, Decree 55 on the rules of regulations to implement the National and Local Monuments Act established four levels of protection for cultural heritage that range from most protected for buildings with exceptional value to those that do not need protection given their lack of significance or state of disrepair. Four years later with Decree 118, the definition of cultural heritage was expanded to include documents, archeological excavation, decorative arts, music, objects, books, photography, and urban centers. Around the same time, the CENCREM, or National Center for Conservation, Restoration, and Museum Studies was created. Training young people in preservation trains, trades combined with offering a four-year bachelor's degree on cultural resource, resource management at the Colegio Universitario San Jerónimo have been key elements of the preservation project in Havana. Another key aspect of the preservation project in Havana, and perhaps the one that differentiates it the most from its counterparts in San Juan and Santo Domingo is the management model created to run the office of the city of the historian. Since 1993, a special decree gave it the authority to know, decide and control issues pertaining to land use, investment and permit. The creation of this autonomous business model allows it to obtain revenues from hotel, hotels businesses and other services, as well as a type of tax from companies in the area. This model is based on several principles that stem from the understanding that conservation is a top priority for the government. First, confidence in the office of the historian as the entity to carry out the mission of conservation. Second, the existence of a special legislation to support it. Third, the right of the office of the historian to acquire buildings for this purpose. And last but not least, a structure that allows for the reinvestment of revenue based on the priorities established by the office in the city's urban plan. They estimate that over 400 structures have been rehabilitated with this model. More importantly, they have the capacity to carry out the complete conservation cycle from identification, documentation, investment, project execution, construction, and management. The 1952 Constitution of Puerto Rico included an article, Article 6, that established the conservation of natural and cultural resources as public policy. Three years later, in 1955, Law 89 created the Institute of Puerto Rican Culture with Ricardo Alegría, a Puerto Rican anthropologist, as director. This was the first public office dedicated to the protection and dissemination of Puerto Rico's culture. 
Law 89 also gave the Institute an advisory role at the planning board, an entity that oversees matters and policies uh, that affect areas of historic significance and construction and intervention to properties in those areas. This was the first law of its kind in the Caribbean. In its initial conception, the Institute looked to Mexico, who recognized the country's right and responsibility to preserve places of significance over individual property rights. With the creation of the Institute, several preservation projects immediately began. Initially, efforts were concentrated in protecting Old San Juan, a city that had deteriorated and that was under constant threat of demolition. Here you see a citizen's guide to historic preservation that begins with a comic strip portraying a man who is surprised to see that a house on his town that belonged to a famous poet is scheduled for demolition and he organizes a group of neighbors who have fond memories of the house to see what they can do about it. It explains the current eligibility criteria for inclusion, which are similar to the National Register ones. Properties must be 50, uh, older than 50 years, although this can be waived. They must be associated with events that have made significant contributions to our history or with the life of people significant to our past, embody distinctive characteristics of a type, period, or method of construction, represent great artisanal value, be an urban space of significance or beauty, have the capacity to reveal information about history or prehistory, or be a religious property important because of their architectural, artistic, or historic merits. With the passing of the 1966 National Historic Preservation Act, state historic preservation offices were established. The act also created the National Register of Historic Places to coordinate and support public and private efforts to identify, evaluate, and protect America's historic and architectural resources. In states like New York, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, and California that already had local preservation programs, establishing shippos and finding matching funds was a smoother process. In Puerto Rico, SHPO began as a program within the Institute of Puerto Rican Culture. Ricardo Alegria was named liaison to the historic to the State Historic Preservation Office. For more than a decade, SHPO, or a version of it, lived within the Institute and its agenda was tied to the preservation projects the Institute took on. A more formal office would have to wait until the 1980s. Following demands from the federal government, the State Historic Preservation Office was moved to the governor's office. Although the ship as we know it today, and as a counterpart to other offices in the US did not fully form until the year 2000. With the extension of the 1966 Act to Puerto Rico, two regulating scenarios were established. On the one hand, the Institute of Puerto Rican Culture already oversaw conservation efforts. On the other, the extension of SHPO to Puerto Rico put the country's heritage in the context of a federal agenda. Today, properties can be nominated through the Institute for inclusion on a local register overseen by the planning board and properties can also be nominated through SHPO for inclusion in the National Register of Historic Places. It would seem that having more regulatory entities would offer increased protection to cultural resources, but increased regulations do not equal improved protection, especially if they come from different agencies. There is also the issue of shared jurisdiction, which can be confusing at times and a political issue at others. Just to give you an example, the walls of San Juan, which you can see on the slide, are mostly managed by the National Park Service. But there are parts of it that are managed by the Department of Public Works, a local governmental office. This means that there are two entities managing one resource and you can see in the slide sort of a line that divides conservation treatments where one jurisdiction ends and the other begins. I have mentioned that in all three cities, conservation began by concentrating all efforts on revitalizing the Spanish colonial city centers and focusing on preserving individual buildings. Later on, each place has developed a broader and more inclusive preservation project, but Spanish colonial heritage is still a dominant force in preservation efforts. There are multiple reason for, reasons for this. One of those reasons is the economic impact that tourism has in all three places and Spanish colonial buildings are an important aspect of that. Another important aspect is the relationship that each place has with its past, which is why exploring how we remember 
is so interesting to me. I'm interested in better understanding the meanings, the uses, and even the abuses of memory that are part of constructing historical narratives, because memory is such an important aspect of the work we do as preservationists. I am particularly interested in the relationship between memory and space and how that affects what we choose to preserve. Memory is defined as the power or process of reproducing or recalling what has been learned and retained, especially through associative mechanisms. This definition helps us to understand memory as an ability that people have to register, organize, store, and recall experiences. This very complex function is what allows us to recall information that has been stored in our brains. For this operation to take place, a series of steps need to happen. First is the stage of fixation where information is registered. This is followed by a process of storing that information. Afterwards, a process of evoking takes place and we can search and find information that has been stored. And once we do, we feel a sense of familiarity with that information. Memory is a series of actions through which we locate ourselves in time and space with reference to ourselves and the information we recall. There are several ways to classify memory. First, we can categorize it by making a distinction of the time of duration. Here we can talk about sensory, immediate, recent, and remote memory. Another way would be based on what it contains or for that which it is used for. Here we can talk about six categories, reference, work, periodic, semantic, declaratory, and procedural. Regardless of the type, when we talk about memory, we are evoking information in time through the process of remembering. The types of memory and the ways we remember can explain a more clinical side of memory, something that I find truly fascinating. But I'm also interested in the consequences that remembering and forgetting have in a personal and social level. My grandfather, who was a lawyer, had the most incredible memory. You could ask him about any case and he could recite the decision and tell you in what volume and page of the decisions of Puerto Rico books it was located. And when he got Alzheimer, it was heartbreaking to see how one of his superpowers slowly diminished until it was completely gone. I understood then how fragile memory was, not just for him, but for all of us. Because when one person forgets, it breaks the bond that memories create. Since then, I have been interested in exploring memory and have focused on the connections between memory and space. Mostly because I cannot recall any of my memories without locating myself in the place they happened. Preservation as a discipline exists through the creation of phenomena in time that reference memory or the act of remembering. Whether we are talking about the past, the present, the future, or a combination of these times, preservation is always built in relationship to and even in terms of time. But preservation is also built in relationship to space. Chavez Ortiz explains that memory or collective recollections, whether public or private, turn a town, a neighborhood, or a city into places where life has sedimented itself, making them livable, but shows the importance of exploring the role that memory plays in this process of transforming between space and place. He goes on to say that generally, when we remember something from the past, it's because we need those recollections to function in the present. It is because of material or symbolic interests or needs in the presence that we resort to our memory to look for what is of interest or significance to us. Our consciousness accepts what is useful and rejects what is not. This begins to explain why memory is unstable, but instead it is a construction that we make or that is made for us. These notions of remembering and forgetting are crucial to our understanding of preservation beyond the object. The reasons we choose to preserve some things and not others go beyond the criteria that I mentioned earlier. It has to do with the narratives, with the narratives that are crafted around things, events, people, and that we want to remember or not. However, it isn't this simple. It's not often a single decision, but a series of events that together construct a narrative that impacts our perception of space and our understanding of history. Memory is crucial to us, to both, to us, both personally and collectively. 
Giuseppe Montagnola, a Catalan architect, questions if there can be freedom without memory. This made me think of Puerto Rico, where our relationship with memory is very particular. The case of Puerto Rico is an interesting one to explore. This predilection for Spanish colonial architecture, which dates back at least to the mid 50s with the creation of the Institute of Puerto Rican Culture. Even though its mission was to preserve Puerto Rico's culture, in terms of the built environment, it focused on the preservation and even the fabrication of Spanish colonial architecture. Ricardo Alegría, the Institute's director, favored what came to be known as the old San Juan style, which is what you see here on the left, a contemporary structure built to look colonial. This one was built in 1992 as part of the massive celebration that commemorated 500 years of Spanish presence in Puerto Rico, which is why you see the flags painted on the right hand image in the Cuartel de Vallaja. You can also see it in the way some buildings have been transformed through time to seem more colonial, up to the point that if you don't know about it, it would be hard to distinguish them. Here you see the changes to the First Baptist Church, later the Rialto Theater, and today a Burger King, and to the San Juan Episcopal Church, later used at the headquarters of the Partido Popular Democratic, Democratico, and today a children's museum. The use of other architectural styles aside from colonial in Puerto Rico also had specific intentions. In the early 20th century, the US relied on the use of Spanish inspired architecture, such as California Mission, Spanish Renaissance, Baroque Spanish Revival, to mitigate the imposition that the change of government had brought. Architecture in Puerto Rico has been a tangible expression of our political circumstances. Enrique Viboni tells us that both Spanish and American colonial powers utilize architecture as an instrument of propaganda. In the same manner that styles served in times of Spain to signify an oppressive police order, the American government used it to signify the insertion of Puerto Ricans into the American way of life. This is not usually part of the heritage narrative. Instead, we focus on the architectural contribution these buildings have made and in preserving the physical aspect, often the void of the stories and the context around them. Ana Teresa Ortega, a Spanish photographer, on a recent interview about her work, explains that to a large extent, our culture has been built on willfully forgetting. Puerto Rico's complex political situation permeates all aspects of life and conditions our relationship both to the past and to the present. Remembering and forgetting take on a very special meaning there. If to remember is to have a memory or to set off in search of a memory as Ricoeur explains, then what is it that we remember in Puerto Rico? What memories have we set in search of? For Puerto Ricans, our interpretation of the past, how we tell it and how we, re how we preserve it is afflicted by feelings of both nostalgia and rejection. Our relationship with the past is still uncertain. Equally unclear is our relationship with the future. The country's current political condition makes long-term planning not only difficult, but also less about the future and more about the condition itself. In spaces such as this one, forgetting seems to be easier than remembering, a binary opposition that presents an important challenge to historic preservation. When thinking about memory in the Hispanic Caribbean, this quote by C.S. Lewis comes to mind. It serves as a reminder of the optimism needed to overcome the socio-political conditions these three countries have, have. Looking back is a process of selection during which some things are left behind. Although it's especially fitting, it's important to acknowledge that it's not exclusive to the Hispanic Caribbean. Remembering is a complex operation and it's just as complex as the preservation decisions we make every day. Spanish colonial heritage is only a part of our history, which makes questioning what we remember and what is forgotten even more important. Thank you. Nadia, thank you so much for that presentation. And we do have a couple of questions already in the chat. And I wanna again, encourage people in attendance to use the chat to drop in any of the questions that you might like Nadia to, um, to consider. And I actually am going to start with a first question from uh, Fred Bland, chairman of the Fitch Foundation. 
Fred's question is this, how do we reconcile the broad power given to the Havana czar Peren, including purchase of properties with the overriding power of the all powerful dictator Castro? That's a great question. It's, I don't know how we can reconcile those two. I do know that the model worked incredibly well for the purpose of preservation only because of the political situation that it was created within. I don't think it's reproducible. Um, I don't think it would have worked or it was possible in San Juan or Santo Domingo. But I do think that both the political regime and even the embargo and the difficulties of accessing outside resources helped make that model stronger and preserve or maintain a lot of buildings that in, other, in the other two cities are long gone because of the idea of demolishing and building anew because that signified progress. Mm -hmm. uh, next question is from Teo Prudhan, your uh, Fitch Foundation advisor for this project. We're very grateful for all of his help uh, bringing everything to fruition tonight. Um, so the question is, how does the current focus on slavery and sugar affect the interpretation of memory in these three cities? Yeah, um, I had a slide that I um, didn't include, um, but I asked the same question on a tour a while back in Puerto Rico where they have rehabilitated sugar plantations and you can take tours. And there was mention of the house, the hacienda, there was mention of the plantation, and there was special mention and tour of the machinery that is one of the last remainings. Um, I can't remember exactly what type of machinery it was, but it's one of the last remaining ones. And there was no mention of the slaves or uh, the slave quarters or anything that had to do with uh, the crucial uh, infrastructure and human uh, capital that was necessary for those places to thrive and survive. And the answer that I got was they pointed me to where the slave quarters were and they would have been right in front of the hacienda, um, of the main house. So they didn't want it to be there because it would interfere with the view. So I think that gives us a little bit of insight into um, a top-down approach and idea of slavery and what uh, they want to cater to in terms of visitors. Um, although I don't think it gives us a bottoms up understanding of preservation. And I think there are in all three places, um, groups and people very much interested in reclaiming the, uh, the Afro, the African, the Afro heritage, Afro-Cuban, Afro-Puerto Rican, Afro-Dominican heritage. But I'm not sure that it is um, as much a part of the official institutions as it should be. I think it might be easier in food and other forms of heritage, song, dance, food, but not as much in the built environment. And your project started in 2016 and even before then, between that time and now, especially all of the events that have been happening in the continental US in the last year and a half, have you seen that shift? Are you seeing more people you know, understand that this is far delayed, this is imperative at this point? Yes, I think um, it has definitely had an impact. I think not just the recent events that happened in the US with the death of George Floyd a year ago, but with um, there was a, you know, a collective movement um, two summers ago to 
force the current governor, Ricardo Rosselló, to um, leave office. And I think part of that collective movement was recognizing the importance of local sovereignty and that brought people together in a way that you know I haven't seen in a long time and that came with the recognition on the importance of local heritage and the need for it to be a broader much more inclusive one. So the next question is from Mary Dirix. Um, you're, you've talked about how um, there are certain choices, decisions that are made, what should and should not be preserved. Can you give us some examples of uh, building sites, any piece of um, heritage that you feel should be preserved and has thus far been neglected? I think one example is the Hacienda La Esperanza, the one I mentioned earlier. So the slave quarters are not there anymore. Um, I, I'm not sure I would recommend a reconstruction of that, but there's also no mention. There is no footprint on the floor. There is very little about not just the history of slavery, but also the people that inhabited um, that hacienda in particular, which um, can be traced. So I think that would be definitely one example, but I think there are many others. It's been difficult to preserve modern heritage in Puerto Rico. Um, there is, uh, there's one building, one beautiful hotel. I'm not sure if um, maybe some of you might know it, the Normandy Hotel, um, which will be scheduled for demolition. Um, there, uh, the Cerro Mar Hotel, which was an incredible modern hotel, um, is being demolished. They claimed, among other things, structural failure, um, but they're having the hardest time demolishing it. <laughs> um, so they can't get rid of the structure. Um, so I think there are many things. I mean, there's a need for inclusive narratives for LGBTQ plus heritage. Um, I think for the inclusion of women's history. I mean, I think there's so much more that, um, that can be part of that heritage uh, narrative. So uh, another question also from Fred, you mentioned early on uh, the early settlement of the islands uh, by people originally from uh, South America. Are there preservation efforts of pre-colonial artifacts and sites? There is a little bit of it. There is not enough of it. Um, I think there needs to be more of it and a lot more interpretation. Um, I think that's part of that idea of the incomplete history that I mentioned earlier. You know, a lot of it was focused on, um, yes, there were indigenous people, but they were soon um, eradicated when the Spaniards came. And then we focus a lot on this period and that's what we have also chosen to preserve. So I think there definitely needs to be more. Um, there are some settlements that you can visit, which is a mix of some, um, which is a lot of reconstructions, truly. Um, but I think a lot more needs to be done. And do you find that in these three cities, is there the same kind of, you know, I'm thinking specifically to, um, we're both based here in New York City, is, is there the same kind of culture of citizen activism? Do you find a lot of um, community-based groups coming together around, for example, your uh, point into a need for preservation of modern architecture? Is that mostly coming from a professional constituency or do you see, um, you know, quote unquote, everyday citizens also getting involved in these projects or causes? I think it's a mix of professionals and everyday people that come together. Um, I think there's a lot of interest and efforts. Um, they still deal with, uh, you know, a huge reality of the difficulties 
of um, saving and preserving this buildings, which I guess you deal with everywhere. Um, but I think there are definitely interested groups and I think you can feel it. You know, I've been um, standing in front of a modern building in any of these cities and people just come to you because you see that they are in state of disrepair and people just come up to me and tell me, you know, that building used to be beautiful. Um, so I think people definitely have an appreciation and can still remember them in the time that they looked, um, that they were in the you know height of their um, appearance. So maybe to kind of bring things to a close, can you give us a sense of where you intend to take this research next? Are you still uh, doing on the ground uh, information gathering? What, what are your plans? Um, I, I do, I'm not doing a lot more of information gathering because everything has been closed for so long, but I do have a lot of information that I would like to just um, continue to put together. Um, and I, you know, find new things all the time. Um, and I think it would be a great place to just sort of think of and really question um, that what we have chosen to preserve in each of the cities was not a given and was actually a choice. And that, um, those choices were made at a certain point in time, but new choices can be made, not at the expense of those choices or that fabric, but new choices can be made um, in order to broaden the discourse and really have a more inclusive um, heritage. Wonderful. And there's a, a one uh, more of a comment than a question in the chat. It's a little long, so maybe it's best um, for you to, to read it, Nadia. Um, but I, while you maybe give that a read, I'll just let people know that um, you can go to fitchfoundation.org and go to our fellows page to, um, to make sure you follow along with Nadia as she continues to share with us and we'll share with you updates on her project. Um, so that's one place you can be in touch with her. Uh, and I'm sure she also would welcome people to follow up directly through email. We're happy to help facilitate that. Um, any final thoughts then, Nadia? I just wanted to thank you and the Fitch Foundation again for this incredible honor and opportunity. And thank everyone. I know it's late um, <laughs> and you've probably been in tons of Zooms and on the computer all day. So I really appreciate your time and bearing with me. And I am grateful to have been able to share this with you. We appreciate it. Thank you everyone so much for coming. If you have any follow-up questions, feel free to email me, Christiana um, C. Pena, P-E-N-A at FitchFoundation.org. I'd be happy to put you in touch with Nadia going forward. And we'll also send around a notice once we've uh, shared the presentation on our YouTube so it can live on and hopefully um, we'll gather more comments and insights and keep the conversation going. Thank you very much. All right, have a good evening, everybody.